Hi, everybody. Um, it's 929, so I'm just about a minute early. Oh, I'm wearing my I'd Be a Nerd Now t-shirt because only an I'd Be Nerd would be on YouTube setting for their final at 930 in the morning. So, yay! <laughs> only a former I'd Be Nerd would be doing a YouTube Live going over uh, information for their final. So, I'm going to try to share this stream on Schoology real quick. So pardon me while I post that. Somebody's here. Um, when you guys get here, if you could just say that you're here, um, we'll get started in just a second. You're welcome, Eric. I'm glad to do this. Um, I'm actually hoping this summer I can record some videos so that um, it's less live. I'm really irritated by live videos. I feel like I sit around waiting for things to start. <clears throat> so I'm hoping I can do kind of more condensed videos this summer on our topics so that next year I can just post them on YouTube and then people can look at them themselves. And that would be good. So I'm just trying to post this on Schoology still so people have the link. The reason I haven't done that so far is I need to learn some video editing software. Um, the last time I like seriously edited videos was in college when it was on VHS tapes and that was a different world. Um, so I'm hoping I can use WeVideo to do this. My computer's being a little slow. <clears throat> okay, link semester to final live review. Okay, so let's see what questions you all have. So <clears throat> um, Alexis asked if I could go over Louis Napoleon and Napoleon III. Um, so to do that, I'm gonna backtrack just a sec. And actually maybe, Maybe in the comments, it would be handy to say like at what point in the video I went over things, but I can't, I'm not sure if you guys will be able to see the chat. I think you will. Okay. So um, Alexis asked if I could go over Louis Napoleon and Napoleon the third and yes, I can do that. And I'm also, I'm going to start by going over 1848 just a little bit. <clears throat> so if you remember, the reason that we have these French people in 1848 in our review, even though um, we're really just doing unification in 1848 in Austria and Italy, is that it all starts in France. It's one of those moments where France sneezes and Europe catches a cold. So in 1848, there's two revolutions in France. There's one in February, which is the... Um, where Louis Philippe, so Louis Philippe was the guy who was elected in the revolution of 1830, not elected, he was approved by popular sovereignty. So it's not like they had a bunch of people on the ballot. It's just that the monarchist said, well, we're sick of this branch of the Bourbon family. So um, we're going to choose Louis Philippe instead. And so Louis Philippe is chosen, sort of approved by popular sovereignty, meaning that instead of his authority coming from divine right of kings. So from God, his authority comes from the approval of the people. So he starts as the citizen king. That's one of the things I would talk about with him. And Andy, you just asked about Louis Philippe. So hopefully this will cover that. Let me know if there's anything else you're wondering about. Um, and he's from a different branch of the Bourbon family. He's from the Orléans branch. He was a, a descended from the brother of Louis the 14th, <coughs> who, by the way, fascinating character, um, cross-dressed at court, kind of openly homosexual, but also had, um, you know, a wife and children as one did. Um, so he, people choose him because he seems to be more of a bourgeois guy. He's led a more bourgeois life. He hadn't grown up in palaces and things. Um, but by 1848, <clears throat> he had seemed out of touch. Um, he had, I mean, I think him gaining a bunch of weight is sort of symbolic of that shift because he's, you know, leading a more luxurious life of plenty. Um, but also wasn't helping the workers the way that people had hoped. And um, you get a sense for this, I think, if any of you watched Les Mis. 
So um, Louis Philippe then closes the national, uh, I'm sorry, the banquets in in Paris, which were kind of meetings where people got together to discuss the the problems of the day. He it's a conservative move, right? To shut down this sort of public meeting. So he does that. <clears throat> and then um, there's riots in the street and, <coughs> excuse me, I've always developed a cough. Um, he's forced to abdicate in February. So then the 1848 revolution, um, by then has sort of caught on and Vienna has the March days in 1848. And um, that's going to be, lead to the eventual um, fleeing of Metternich and the abdication of the Austrian emperor. It's going to spread to the Italian states, which if you recall, are largely controlled by, um, by the Austrians. And that will eventually then le lead to the 1848 Roman Republic being founded. Eventually the Austrians will go in and kind of squash a lot of that rebellion in the, <clears throat> in the Italian states. Um, some, of their rebellions they had gotten under control with the help of the Russians. <coughs> so in France though, that chaos kind of continues through the summer. They have the bloody June days. Uh, Louis Blanc, I can't remember if he's on your study guide or not, um, creates the national workshops, which creates a right to work, right? So that's really aimed at helping the workers. And um, Louis Napoleon will run as for president in December of 1848. So in December of 1848, there's Louis Napoleon and there's a guy named Louis Cavanaugh who we didn't talk about a lot, but he's sort of more of a military kind of crackdown guy. And Louis Napoleon wins largely on the popularity of his name and this kind of uh, nostalgia for the, the great days of um, rule under Napoleon. <clears throat> 1851 and a very Napoleonic move instead of being the president of France, he names himself emperor for life, and then he becomes Napoleon III. Now, we shifted away from France at that point, so there's a lot you could say about the um, about France under Napoleon, but he does come up again in Italian unification because one of the ways that um, Cavour decides that he needs to get rid of Austrian control on the Italian peninsula is to get the assistance of the French. He figures the French also want to reduce Austrian control so that they can kind of have more glory. By 1850s, Napoleon, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III's popularity is waning. And just to be clear, before 1851, you would call him Louis Napoleon. After 1851, he's Napoleon III. Um, so Louis Napoleon meets with Cavour at Plombieres and they plan the Austro-Sardinian war, basically trying to figure out a way to provoke the Austrians to declare war on Prussia and then France will come to their aid. In the middle of that Austro-Sardinian war, France will make a separate peace with Austria. They're, they're really the ones contributing a lot of the troops. And um, then Piedmont will add Lombardy at that point um, to their territory. Then we don't hear from Louis Napoleon again until, at least in the topics we've done, <clears throat> obviously he's still doing things in France, uh, until we get to German unification in the Franco-Prussian War. Um, he's still in charge of France at that point. So when the Prussians invade, uh, you know, are gonna push into France in the Franco-Prussian War, <coughs> he's the one that is supposedly insulted in the Ems telegram too, right? So this stuff all starts to come together at the end. Um, he will be forced to abdicate after the Battle of Sedan, and then France will be uh, declared a republic after the Franco-Prussian War. So I know that was a lot on Napoleon III, um, but those are all of the moments when he shows up. So 1848, Plombier's meeting, Franco-Prussian War. I think that's largely it. Um, okay, so then um, Eric asked to go over the Sonderweg debate. So Jeff Ely and Hans Ulrich Wehler. So I'm gonna just type that down at, actually, could one of you guys take this over for me? Just say like, I typed Sonderweg 944, so I know <clears throat> somebody can go back and find those terms at that time. Um, if one of you could take that over, that would be great. If you're 
any volunteers, just say something in the comments. So um, Hans Ulrich Wehler is a German historian and he presents this idea of German history taking a special path or in German a Sonderweg, right? And he says that 1848, and you see how this keeps coming back, it's such a turning point year because it's this attempt for German liberals to create at least constitutional monarchies, if not republics, right? So we see in Frankfurt and in Berlin, they're really pushing for a constitutional monarchy um, with the whole gross Deutschland, Klein Deutschland debate, um, <clears throat> whether or not Austria would be a part of German unification. And thanks, Andy. Um, we also see the, the Mazzini creating the Roman Republic in 1848 to 49. Like it's just such a moment. It's a time where liberals are really trying to change the course of how Europe is governed. So um, Baylor looks at this moment and sees it as a failure. And to a large extent it is, right? Like they don't, they don't unify under the Prussian monarch and create a Prussian monarchy at that point. I mean, that was Bismarck's critique that the matters of the day will not be solved by parliamentary debate, but by blood and iron, right? So Andy, maybe you could tag that right there. Um, that means that they weren't gonna talk it out. Bismarck was gonna have to make it happen. <clears throat> so Wehler interprets all of this as the moment where where Germany went wrong. They didn't have this liberal tradition that you see really kind of progressing, certainly almost, I mean, there's certainly interruptions in England, but you see much more gradual progression towards um, reducing the power of the monarchy and increasing the power of the parliament in England from about the time of the Glorious Revolution, which was like in the 1600s. Um, I've just been, oh, you can't see the timestamps. Never mind. Sorry, Andy. Um, okay, so I'll just keep doing this then. So England had progressed towards an increasingly liberal government. France, yeah, Napoleon comes in, but you also see a progression towards, no problem, you also see a progression towards increased liberalization, right? Because after 1871, <clears throat> you have the creation of a French Republic after the Franco-Prussian War, whereas Germany fails to create a constitutional monarchy in 1848. And when they do finally unify, it's under um, this very strong chancellor, right? Who's not allowing for a lot of parliamentary debate and <coughs> political parties when he's concerned about the power of the socialists, for instance. Um, he will try to undermine them by, um, he'll try to undermine them by, uh, giving them everything that they want. I probably need to stop doing the timestamp thing because it's really interrupting my train of thought and it's gonna make this annoying to watch. Now, um, Ely says, well, what, who says that that English and uh, French progression is the norm, right? It's only a norm <coughs> because we've decided that that's the norm. Um, Germany didn't go wrong or take the special path. They just took a different path to modernization. And he points to all of the liberal reforms that benefited industrial capitalists, which is really where the power of the liberals come from, um, under Bismarck's rule. He also says that um, we really just have to rethink how we compare countries, um, that we have to take them sort of on their own terms. Whereas Wehler says, no, 1848 is such a turning point, liberalism fails. And after that, because they have no liberal tradition, that's going to be a direct line to the Nazis. <coughs> I think Ely would start the rise of the Nazis more with maybe the nationalism that um, arises like Peter Fritsche talks about uh, in August of 1914, how World War I changes everything. Um, and then the, the whole <clears throat> Treaty of Versailles leading to Nazi power as well. Um, so Baylor, Sonderweg, Ely, don't take Britain and France as a norm. And um, there were liberal reforms or reforms that benefited liberals under uh, Bismarck. Whereas Baylor says that Bismarck was a Bonapartist dictator, that he was uh, charismatic, plebiscitary, and authoritarian. Okay, 
So who else is on here? So let's talk about German unification a little bit. So <clears throat> the Danish war is really about, can I point to it here? This little, do you see the little, no, I'm going backwards. That little pink area right below Denmark that sticks out on the peninsula, that's Schleswig. And so um, that had been lost to the Danes. Schleswig-Holstein had been actually Schleswig had, I'm not sure about, I can't remember about Holstein, had been lost to the Danes in 1848 as part of the kind of chaos that happened <clears throat> or had been, I guess, absorbed by the Danes in 1848. And Bismarck said, look, these are Germans. We need to get them back under our control. But really, I think what that whole Danish war was about was uh, answering the question of Austria. Because there's two questions that Bismarck really has to answer with unification. Um, is Austria going to be a part of it, which he doesn't want because he's Prussian, not Austrian. Uh, and he sees this as sort of an extension of Prussian power. And how are we going to keep the French from screwing up the whole thing? So the Danish war then is going to be with Prussia and Austria unified. Um, they will rather quickly defeat the Danes with Prussia taking Schleswig and Austria taking Holstein. But that doesn't really answer the Danish question. I'm sorry, the Austrian question. So um, that's what the Austro-Prussian War of 1866 is about. And the Austro-Prussian War, <clears throat> the Prussians quickly defeat the Austrians. Um, the last big battle there, I think, is the Battle of uh, Sadova, S-A-D-O-W-A. And um, that will be how then Prussia adds Holstein to their territory. <laughs> and they also then will be able to take control of the North German Confederation. Um, and then in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 to 71, he answers the question of like, how do we keep, well, first off, how do we get the Southern states on board with this whole program? Because who says that Prussia should lead the whole thing? They weren't necessarily okay with that. There's still a big religious division between North and South. And I think a lot of cultural divisions as well. And, and how do we keep France from just invading us? So, um, like constantly. So Bismarck provokes the war with France with the Ems dispatch or Ems telegram, whichever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> editing that down to make it look as if the Kaiser had insulted the French. That's published in France um, on July 15th, if you recall, the day after Bastille Day. Makes everybody in, in France angry. They declare war on the Prussians. The Franco-Prussian War begins. <clears throat> the siege of Paris is awful. It will... Um, you know, lead to such starvation in Paris because Paris is basically blockaded, right? Like it's the same problem in Paris in 1870 that we see in Germany in 1914 to 1918. Um, they're not getting stuff in and out and cities don't support themselves. They need the countryside for all that food. So Paris is starving. They eat the zoo animals, for instance. We listened to that podcast about them trying to like, <clears throat> they don't have any communication. They're using hot air balloons to try to, um, you know, get news out and, or news in and people out. Um, but eventually the Prussians defeat the French, um, declare the creation of the German Empire on January 18th, 1871, uh, in the Hall of Mirrors at the Treaty of Versailles, which is like this big mm -hmm, to the French, right? Which then the French will come back and get their revenge on the Germans uh, in 1918. And I actually just saw a great cartoon of that that had Clemenceau like doing this sort of medieval torture of Germany uh, with the Treaty of Versailles. So um, that was a little bit about German unification. Cavour's contributions in general, um, I think I said this in class, but Cavour is to Italian unification as Bismarck is to German unification. He is the mastermind of the final unification that, <coughs> that um, he's, he's playing politics, right? He's not trying to win everybody over with love, which is probably kind of the route Mazzini would have taken. He's not even straight out invading them, which is kind of what Garibaldi does, trying to get rid of the um, Bourbon control of the South. He's using diplomacy and pretty, um, it would be real politique, right? It's that practical politics. He doesn't care about the ideology. He's trying to manipulate people to get what he wants. So he's definitely the mastermind of that. He is the chancellor of, uh, actually, sorry, not the chancellor, the foreign minister of uh, Piedmont Sardinia. Uh, Piedmont Sardinia had been unified by the uh, Congress of Vienna. Uh, wait, actually scratch that. 
They might have been unified after the Crimean War. I would have to double check that, but it's not on the final, so let's not worry about it right at this moment. <clears throat> um, Cavour uh, will, at the Plombiers meeting, organize the French assistance with the Austrians. He gets Lombardy. Um, after the Austro-Prussian War in, well, okay, so he, let's, let me back up because if we're just doing Cavour, I can't talk about the Austro-Prussian War because he's already dead. Um, <clears throat> so he gets Lombardy. He really is pushing the Austrians out of the peninsula. And then when Garibaldi marches north, um, Cavour will intercede basically on the behalf of Victor Emmanuel II, the king of Piedmont, Sardinia, convince Garibaldi to support Victor Emmanuel II and Piedmont Sardinia's leadership. Garibaldi will sort of compromise at that point. He's more interested in the unification of uh, the Italian states than he is in, you know, totally sold on the idea of it being a republic, which Mazzini would have been like, you know, cataclysmic about that. Um, <clears throat> and then um, Italy is largely unified in 1860-61 um, with that contribution of the southern states and then uh, Cavour dies and then in 1866 as a result of the Austro-Prussian War the Italians take uh, Venetia which is kind of uh, like up here in the north from Austria and um, <clears throat> that's kind of their compromise with the, the Prussians um, and then they'll get Rome when the French move their troops back to France in 1870 because they're fighting the Prussians. So really, Venetia and Rome are only added to Italy um, kind of as a consequence of German unification. <coughs> okay. Uh, Communist Manifesto. I, I really, we did short shift to the Communist Manifesto this this year, and I hope that um, you guys go back and spend some time with that at some point because it really is uh, language wise, I think is quite beautiful. Like I just like words, you know, um, but also was so so important in the course of European history. But eighteen four, it also comes out of eighteen forty eight, and the things that we talked about in class was that Marx is really seeing history through the lens of class struggle. <clears throat> so for instance, the Marxist interpretation of the French Revolution is that the bourgeoisie kind of challenged the aristocracy that leads to the rise of the bourgeoisie. Later historians have said, well, no, not really. It led from the rise of, it took the power from the aristocracy and gave it to the hand, into the hands of like other wealthy, um, sometimes landed, arist not aristocracy, but people with lots of land, um, some wealthy capitalists, but you really just took it from one wealthy group to another wealthy group. So then it's not really like class conflict because the bourgeoisie were quite wealthy as well. <coughs> um, Marx talks about how much capitalism really drives imperialism. That was one of the things that we said that it's very destructive, that this need to like constantly search for resources and markets is going to really um, destabilize Europe. And then um, what else did we talk about in the Communist Manifesto? Um, just how much it is like Marx was really about um, trying to put the power back in the hands of the workers, that the workers are doing all of the labor. So why should the capitalists who really are capitalists because they started with some money, right? They had the capital, the money to invest. Um, they benefit mostly from capitalism. And Marx says that the laborers, the proletariat, should be sharing in that wealth. Um, okay. <clears throat> First and second Moroccan crisis, Delina asked about. So this gets into imperialism as a cause of World War I. And just to review real quick, the causes of World War I, um, I manic. So imperialism is going to really resolve, like how do we get all of these competing countries um, who are fighting over the scramble for Africa, right? And you've got the British and the French butting heads and the Germans butting heads. How do we get them into these two armed camps? It's increasing tensions between all of those countries as they compete for resources. <clears throat> um, so that's imperialism and then militarism. Um, that rise, like the naval race, um, the, what else are we talk about with militarism? Oh, the increase in defense spending, um, 
A is alliances, um, the triple entente versus the triple alliance, who's on both sides, how that turns into the allies and the central powers, um, Italy switching sides, America joining, Russia um, having a separate peace with Germany. <clears throat> um, that's the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, by the way, that separate peace where Russia gives up like, you know, like most of this land. <clears throat> um, and then nationalism, that Germany and Italy had recently unified to destabilize the whole balance of power. Um, Germany is really challenging um, the rest of Europe for kind of their place in the sun. And then um, industrialization is going to make the whole thing worse. It's also sort of how ties into imperialism in the sense that industrialization has led to the need for more raw materials and markets for, for um, manufactured goods. And, and see culture of violence, right? That they're like, of course we would solve this with violence. Like this is how things are done. We had the Franco-Prussian war, this quick, neat little war, right? That got Bismarck what he wanted. Um, the dueling to solve manners of honor. Um, I'm not sure how much you can hear my children arguing in the background, but it's distracting me a little bit. Um, so we'll see how much you hear on this. Um, Um, hold on just a second, will you? Oh, and then the difference between the first and second Moroccan crisis. So Morocco is uh, like right here below France. I'm sorry, below Spain, <clears throat> which was under French control. Um, they have a revolt against French control. And the Germans, not so much because they care about Moroccan independence, but because they figure this is our chance, uh, we will stick it to the French um, and then we'll get to be a player on the international stage and maybe people will love us <coughs> and get involved in that. That's an example of Weltpolitik, of this new course that Wilhelm II is setting. And um, so in that first Moroccan crisis, the Germans um, will support the Moroccan claims to break away from the French. The French will say to the British, like, hey, will you help us out? And the British are like, yeah, if you need it, we will. And then at that point, <clears throat> Wilhelm II gives his place in the sun speech that um, they deserve a place in the sun, that they deserve their piece of Africa, that they, to secure that place in the sun, they need a navy, right? Which then connects to militarism. So all this stuff kind of goes together. I think by the end, you can really start to see that all come together. The second Moroccan crisis, not only the British say that they will support the French, they actually send ships to support the French. So that's an indication that this Entente Cordiale, which had been <clears throat> arrived at after the Fashoda crisis, the, it's not like they had the Fashoda crisis and then they formed the Entente Cordiale. It's that the Fashoda crisis was this conflict because France is going sort of north or, I'm sorry, across the northern strip of Africa, and Britain's looking for the kind of Cape to Cairo route. So then their conflicts, well, Fashoda's not on the map, but uh, their conflicts, um, their, their interests intersect at Fashoda, and they almost go to war. But rather than go to war and end up on opposite sides of the alliance, they will um, resolve their differences. So that's what Fashoda is about, is Britain and France, rather than ending up on different sides, uh, will resolve their conflict, which is intense, right? They're the two main powers on the African continent in, ter in terms of European powers trying to carve up Africa. <clears throat> um, and then that will, the the Moroccan crisis is after that. I hope that covered Fashoda. Okay. Oh, Bosnian crisis. Okay. So wait, Napoleon's in the way. Always in the way. Oh, here's my K. Okay, so uh, this purple country is Turkey. This is the Black Sea. This is the Crimea, which they had a war about in 1854. Uh, this is the, ooh, it's hard to point on these. This is the Straits of Bosphorus. Wait, I have a wand. Does that help? Mm, not really. It's still backwards. This is the Dardanelles, kind of the exit from uh, the Black Sea into the Mediterranean, which I'm not able to point out very specifically there. Um, this... This I can hit. This is the Balkan Peninsula, like that whole land mass. And so as the Ottoman Empire over here is starting to kind of crumble because they're the sick man of Europe, 
and they've got all these multinational empires. Russia's like, sweet, we'll get the Black Sea, we'll get access to the Mediterranean, all will be well. And Austria's like, sweet, we'll get the Balkans, all will be well. Like they all would get their goals, right? So the Bosnian crisis in 1908 was a result of that, uh, a compromise that Russia and Austria had made, Austria-Hungary had made about Russia getting the Dardanelles, so the exit um, from the Black Sea, which would give them basically the ability to have a strong Navy because up here, St. Petersburg's always frozen half the year, most of, much of the year, and they needed a warm water seaport. And Austria thinks that um, they can then get uh, more land in the Balkans. So the Bosnian crisis of 1908, Austria will annex Bosnia. <clears throat> it's very small. It's the orange country in the, mm, eh, I can't even forget it. It's over, you can look on it, you look on a map. Um, they annex Bosnia, <coughs> but they jump the gun and they kind of betray the agreement with the Russians and then the Russians never get the Dardanelles. So in 1908, Austria gets what they want by betraying Russia. And you can see how that sets up tension for 1914. Um, so that is the Bosnian crisis of 1908. Um, Andy asked about the turnip winter. The turnip winter of 1915 to 1916 is a result of the British blockade of Germany and the North Sea. Um, Germany's unable to import as much food and really materials to fight the war as they want. Um, and Germany <clears throat> is going to have a, basically a famine. Um, the only thing to eat in Germany in that winter was turnips, which is why they call it the turnip winter. But even those were running short and the caloric intake of the average German civilian goes way down. Um, and so the turnip, whimper, the turnip winter is an example of how much the British blockade affected the German home front. And the British blockade then is so important for the Allied victory because the Germans really are just unable to continue fighting the war. I think I did for sure crisis okay. Uh, Reese, Jay Winter, uh, there's the only thing that's on the final about him is what I, that little thing from the hexagon that I posted on uh, the, the Google Slides review on Schoology, um, <clears throat> just that uh, he points to failed diplomacy of a small group of people in Vienna, so in Austria-Hungary, and in really just Austria, in um, and also in Berlin. So he's looking at um, not just German aggression, like Peter Fritz, or not Peter Fritz, uh, Fritz Fischer. See, I even I make that because they sound similar, but they're really not all that closely related. Um, but he's going to look at how these kind of diplomatic errors led to the outbreak of war. Um, Robert Massey also talks about diplomatic errors, but he talks about it kind of European wide, right? Because that Anglo-Russian Entente article, a lot of that is about failed diplomacy. Wilhelm II's failed chancellor picks leading to it all falling apart. Like he's not just looking at diplomacy, in Paris and Vienna, he's looking at it kind of more European wide. Okay, so that's Jay Winter. League of Nations, Delano was one of Wilson's 14 points, <clears throat> which was meant to, um, hold on just a second. Rather than having all the secret diplomacy as it happened in 1914 that led to so many problems that led to the outbreak of war, um, Wilson wanted to have like open and honest diplomacy and the League of Nations would um, allow that to happen. A couple of things made it not work because obviously it doesn't work or World War II wouldn't happen. Uh, first off, <clears throat> they had no military power. So they could, um, as Andy did in her history day, um, stand up routine, like they could condemn someone, but like, what does that do, right? Like, oh, you're condemned, so what? I'm still gonna invade Czechoslovakia, says Hitler. Um, I'm still thinking of Andy. She's like, Czechoslovakia, stop crying. Um, and then uh, it also, the US doesn't ratify, doesn't join because Wilson is defeated in his reelection campaign. And then um, this kind of isolationist policy in the US leads them to not want to be a part of this kind of worldwide organization. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> Treaty of London. Treaty of London is just, um, if you think back to the original alliances, and some of you, like, these were the only points you missed on the test. There's the dual alliance starts with Germany and Austria, right? <coughs> After the Austro-Prussian War, Bismarck says, there are natural allies. We have to be sure not to injure them too much. So even in 1866, Bismarck sees Austria as like, you know, the one that it makes the most sense to ally with. So the dual alliance is first. That will then become the triple alliance with Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. But we know that doesn't hold up because Italy is going to switch sides. And the Treaty of London is Italy basically agreeing to switch sides and join the allies and to open a southern front against uh, Austria-Hungary. Now, the other reason that that's so, so, so important is if you're writing an essay about how alliances caused World War I, I mean, did they? Because Italy, Italy refused to uphold their alliance. So it's really alliances plus that nationalism and willingness to go to war and culture of violence that makes them want to go to war and want to uphold their alliances and willing to uphold their alliances that makes alliances have any power um, in and of themselves. Like there was a question in August of 1914, whether Britain would actually join, whether they would uphold um, the treaty that had declared uh, Belgian independence. So treaty uh, effects of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk are that, um, I mean, Russia is really very crippled by this. It's a huge, huge loss for them. Um, the reason that it's so important is it shows <clears throat> the Bolsheviks' willingness and understanding that they have to end the war. Um, the provisional government, which had done the first revolution of 1917 in Russia, um, continues to fight the war. They uphold their alliances. Um, and Russia's in no place to do that. So the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk is a huge loss to Russia. It's an opportunity for Germany because now they don't have a war on two fronts anymore, right? They can focus everything on the West. Um, unfortunately for them, America joins at the same time. And in terms of an ally, like America probably brought a lot more at that point than Russia in 1917 did. Um, and I think that's about all we talked about was it? it's this separate piece that the Bolsheviks sign with the Germans, just a reminder of the Bolsheviks putting Lenin on a train and dropping him off. So like that worked out really well for them. <clears throat> the name of, oh, Ashley, you asked for the name of the rebellion in Russia that sped to Germany. I think you're thinking of the Kiel uprising, which wasn't in Russia. Uh, Kiel is up here. It's actually in Holstein. Oh, I forget which, I think it's on this side of the peninsula. Um, Kiel's a harbor town in Germany. And it's a, um, a mutiny that starts when uh, German naval soldiers are sent on what they see as a suicide mission. They think the war is over and the German government's just failing to admit it. And um, so they refuse to, to go on this assignment. It then leads to uh, an uprising in Kiel, which then will spread to the rest of Germany and the German government will collapse. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, at that point, the war is over. The Anglo-Russian Entente is the other side. So I talked about the Triple Alliance side and how that kind of came to be. And I, but I didn't mention is how the Ottomans join. And that's kind of important because that's like a whole other front on the war. Hold on just a second. <clears throat> um, but the Anglo-Russian Entente is one piece of the Triple Entente. So the French and the British, I talked about how they got over Fashoda and managed to come together. But then you have to take the most liberal country in Europe with the strongest parliament and get an alliance with the least liberal country in Europe with the strongest authoritarian ruler. Like, how does that happen, right? So the Anglo-Russian Entente was that nasty article that you guys read <clears throat> about the kind of diplomatic machinations that had to happen for those two to come together, which will then seal. So Germany had the reinsurance treaty with Russia. When that collapses after Bismarck is, is fired, uh, Caprivi allows it to, to collapse, not really kind of understanding the whole goal. Bismarck's goal is to keep France isolated because um, he sees them as like the big other threat on the continent. So Germany's, uh, the reinsurance treaty lapses with Russia. That then leads Russia to form the Franco-Russian alliance. 
um, Britain and uh, France will come together in the Entente Cordiale, the friendly understanding. And that's the deal with the second Moroccan crisis, right? It's not going to just be a friendly understanding. That's not an alliance. The Moroccan crisis indicates that the Entente Cordiale is actually going to be like a defense alliance, that the British are going to back that up with troops. <clears throat> Then we have to get Britain and Russia together, and that's the Anglo-Russian Entente. All right, any other questions for the seven brave who uh, woke up on a Saturday morning? By the way, who is um, Mir KZ? I feel like I've known this before, but I can't remember who it is. I'm just want to give you all, you know, proper kudos for showing up at 9:30 in the morning on a Saturday. No other questions? Are you good to go? Um, <clears throat> Ottoman Empire joining the war. We actually didn't get into that a ton. Most of actually the Balkan Peninsula gets into the war. Um, Serbia, and it sort of has to do with whether they side with Serbia and the Russians or not Serbia and the Russians. Um, so the Ottomans join, I think, because they're worried about um, Russian expansion. You know, they tried to take the Dardanelles, so they end up joining the um, the Central Powers. Um, Bulgaria joins the war. Romania joins the war. But we we didn't talk about them a ton. But yeah, the Ottomans are important important there, <clears throat> especially because them joining the war is really going to lead to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Um, there's a uh, guess what? It's called the Young Turks. So there's the Young Italy, right? In the 1830s, formed by Mazzini, the Young Turks will be formed um, to create a Turkish state. So that's how Turkey will become Turkey and not the Ottoman Empire. I like using this one to point. Yes, the Sarajevo crisis is the July crisis. Same, same. So Sarajevo is the capital of Bosnia, which is the territory that was annexed by Austria in 1908. So if you want to kind of think of it like Sarajevo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Austrian Empire is similar to Denver, Colorado, United States, except that, you know, Colorado wasn't just annexed by the United States against their will. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right. If you guys have no more questions. I will let you get about your day. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, I'm just going to scroll through here real quick and make sure I didn't miss anything. Summer break, summer break, Danish war. Nope, I think that's it. All right, guys, have a good day, and I will see you on Monday. Bye.